Now, especially what I like is your definition of the dynamic directions. Mm -hmm. However, I feel that the conbrio mm -hmm. could be coming out more. You know, there's a great difference between confoco and conbrio. Yeah. You know what it is. I suppose a confoco could be not more aggressive, but more, more alive. Confoco mm -hmm. is that you play with just temperament. Con brio. Brio is a spiritual fire. Leon Fleischer. Claude Frank. Peter Serkin. Richard Good. These distinguished pianists have all studied with Karl Ulrich Schnabel. Karl Ulrich Schnabel stands now alone as the last of a truly great tradition of teachers and performers who have that wonderful link straight from Beethoven. If you think that Mr. Czerny studied with Mr. Beethoven and Leschetizky studied with Czerny and Schnabel studied with Leschetizky, and brought forth a son, Karl Ulrich's novel. You have an extraordinary lineage. He has taught piano master classes all over the world. Israel, South America, Japan, Australia, but always Italy. Always here at Lake Como in the north. For more than half a century, this was home. Students came from everywhere, first to study with his father and then with him. Now he has returned to teach. Thank you. Thanks. So we will work on that now, and I'll tell you in all the places right away where I feel we can make it still better. Okay. Can I? Can you start first? Sure. Mm -hmm. The sixteenth softer. Great. Very good. Now, after we come, this was very great. Was was very good. Can you play this now a little bit more with love? Carl Ulrich Schnabel, or Ruli as he is called, is the eldest son of Theresa Bär, a famous singer of German leader, and Artur Schnabel one of the great interpretive pianists of the 20th century. There was really a great difference in the approach to music between my mother and father. My mother's approach was mainly emotional, and my father's was directed towards form. Actually, in their life together, it served them both, because they both arrived at somewhere in the middle, which was the best of all. But I was always between all of that. And so I, I had to find out my own way. Of course, he has special techniques, uh, like the vibrato that we adore. Uh, but the vibrato is not a vibrato that we do, you do with your fingers. The vibrato is something that you do with your heart. You hear the... Now, this is without vibrato. This is with vibrato. That's very, that's very nice. But it says more or less, ah, here I want to sound beautiful and want all that. But it doesn't that say if you say, I plead with you. Now, what was the difference? The second time I played with vibrato. He is concerned with nobility. He is concerned with uh, 
the grace of the human spirit. He is concerned with expressivity in its fullest sense. It is not anymore just sort of pleading, but it's begging. And then when this falsato comes even more, on top of the page. Oh, I don't know what the invitation is. Only one thing, not come off the left hand. Yeah. You see, there's a rest. Yes. And now, begging. Not enough. If someone would beg to me like that, I would say, oh yeah, maybe I'll give it, maybe I won't. But if you would come with him, if you do it, him, I, I would right away say, I can't say no. There is something mystical, something, some religious love about this art something very strange, something very mystical. And he knows how to teach that. And so this is absolutely incredible. Artur Schnabel was just beginning his career when he met the glorious Teresa Bear. She was uh, six years older than he. My father was 18 years old only. They met and they fell in love with each other. And not too much longer than married. My mother was a very well-known singer. She had been accompanied by practically everybody famous when she was very young. People like Richard Strauss, for instance, accompanied her in public. And I think they were all a little bit influenced by the very strong emotional content of her singing. very personal. Uh, there's a very intimate connection between the singer, the pianist, the poet, and the, and the music. You have very fine, varied emotions. There's a lot of storytelling. Whatever the poet expresses with words, the accompanist will also have to do. If that pianist can then turn around and uh, either play solo music or uh, teach, uh, then maybe you get my grandfather. Get the feeling of Now not just loud, not Not heroic, you see. Play, I mean, as if you say, you run against fate, which has no pity with you. Well, he would suggest that people uh, write down a list of as many emotions as they can think of. When you have nothing else to do, like, for instance, sitting in a bus or so. And after you have a list, uh, he would say, take a very small, uh, simple melody and play it using every one of those emotions. I had one person 
who had played without any emotions. And for her, that was so new that you wouldn't imagine how different her playing became. The playing before was very musical and made sense and all that, but it was dull, very dull. Later on, it changed completely. It became emotional. There is always a level of control uh, for any musician, no matter how inspired they feel. And there's always a level in of inspiration. At age eight, Ruli was accompanying his mother. By his teen years, he was teaching and composing. And at 17, he debuted in Berlin as a concert soloist. It must have been very hard for a budding pianist to have an artist schnabel as a father. It was very hard, there's no doubt about that. Actually, he was against my career as a pianist altogether because he realized very well that it would be extremely difficult with his name to start a career doing the same he did. They had a lot of issues. I mean, uh, he claims that his father was, was a tyrant and would forbid everything. They weren't allowed to go to the movies, and then they weren't allowed to play certain card games, and then he, then he didn't want them to have electric trains. He said that he would just forbid everything. And uh, he also claimed that up to age 18, he followed every order of his father, and after that he would just lie about it because he wanted to do his thing. But with music, he always admired his father. I was different from others, you see. How are you different? By having more fantasy, I would say, and by having more passions, and uh, expecting more from life. He lived under the figure of one of the great, great musicians of the 20th century. What was so extraordinary was that he had the integrity and the courage to not follow blindly in his father's footsteps. It would have been so easy either to, to copy or to give up, you know, to do something else. I have been on the top of every one of these mountains. It, it, it's a very beautiful view. Bone climbing was a passion of mine, but never a great technique. You have a good fortissimo, good forte, good mezzo forte, good piano, and no pianissimo. Because it comes from that wrong attitude of thinking that a pianissimo, a real pianissimo, cannot be heard in a large hall. That's nonsense. As long as the audience is quiet, like for instance this audience, you don't even know they're there. That's what I call a good audience, you see. Now, as long as the audience is quiet, they can hear the softest pianissimo. But you have to have the courage to play so soft that practically nothing is coming at all. You see, this should not be That's a kind of a soft piano, but the pianissimo has to be secretive. When you do that, that's exciting for your audience. Mainly it's exciting for your audience because they realize that you are risking your hide for them. That's what an audience wants. An audience doesn't want security. 
We want it out in the street and everywhere else, but at the piano we don't want security. We want risk. Yeah. Places like a wild waltz, you see. As if you are a lady and the devil himself is asking you, will you have a dance with me? And so he dances with her so that, of course, she collapses. So he goes, you have to go absolutely wild. And if you hit all, right, all kinds of wrong notes with the left hand, the better, because then people find out how difficult it is. Berlin in the 1920s was a city of dynamic, artistic vibrancy. Young Ruli grew up among the great musicians of the day, who gathered frequently at the Schnabel family home. It was impossible in this house not to hear music because we had um, three music rooms, one my brother's, um, and one my father's, of course, and one my mother's. There was a salon. That's where all the pupils had to wait. I always went to entertain them. There was beautiful music. There. Uh, beautiful Beethoven sonatas coming from one side and, my, and the Dichterliebe uh, from the other side and Ruli from three, three rooms back. And I acted to that and I danced to it and I did fantastic death scenes. Stefan would become an actor, performing on television and stage throughout a long career. And had world events not intervened, Ruli might have become a filmmaker. I wanted to go into film, you see, and, and I would have given up everything else just to make films. Would you really? Oh, I would have. He did, in fact, make a film, a dark, surrealistic blend of German mysticism and expressionism. Remember, I got the film complete just before the world war started. Then, of course, you were lucky if they let you live. One week after Hitler came to power in 1933, he ordered a national boycott of Jewish businesses and professionals. Arthur Schnabel and many of his contemporaries suddenly found their concerts canceled. Ruli had long been urging his parents to leave Germany. Finally, they agreed. The Schnabels purchased their first motor car. Ruli and Stefan, armed with newly acquired driver's licenses, chauffeured the family over the Alps and down narrow, winding roads to the village of Tremezzo on Lake Como in northern Italy. This rented villa became both home and music studio for Teresa, Artur, and Ruli. Despite ominous events in Germany, students came from all over the world for lessons in the summer. The youngest was a nine-year-old boy from San Francisco, Leon Fleischer. It fills my heart with many, many emotions. Oh, you know, 
These were magnificent times. I got him first through his sponsors who sent him to Europe to study with my father. And he was uh, very impressed about the talent. But he said, I'm very sorry, but I don't teach children. Well, I said, but he's not like a child. He said, I fully realize, but he is a child. I can't teach a child. And then it, it was obviously my father who suggested that he should study with me. Along with Artur, Ruli is the most profound influence in my life, not only as a musician, but as a, as a, as a human being. Because he, he, uh, he had the ability to, to uh, engage and inflame one's, one's imagination. He also played ping pong. Now, this has to sound like an oracle. You know what an oracle is? It's this thing which comes out of the earth, comes a voice and says, you will die tomorrow. This has to sound like an oracle now. comes the deepest oracle. Do you, do you understand what I mean with the oracle? That it's something like coming out of from another world. In the summer of 1935, a young woman from Brooklyn named Helen Fogel came to Como to study with Artur, forever altering the course of Ruli's career and heart. Helen didn't speak German and Ruli didn't speak English, but a language barrier could not compete with love or music. In 1938, Helen had just finished her master classes and she went someplace with Ruli up in the mountains to, forgot exactly where in France. And for that week, my father decided not to new, read a newspaper for the first time, and that's when the war broke out. And then she received a telegram, they did, from uh, Artur's secretary, Peter Diamond, that the war was breaking out and they should get out as fast as possible. So they packed in an hour or two and got on the train to Holland, the two of them. They uh, uh, had a, uh, a family that held them in a safe house, you know, so that they wouldn't be detected in any way. And that delayed them two months until they got passage. Mother was an American citizen, so she got passage right away, but she kept refusing to go until they would take him too. I know. The little news that we got, we were worried that they wouldn't make it back. The young couple settled safely in America, but it was the wrong time to pursue a concert career. For somebody like Artur, who was already very well known, uh, the damage was, was just non-existent. But for the people beginning, uh, it, just, it just stopped them at a time that was very detrimental to their careers. They each took jobs in a defense plant. Until the war's end, music would have to wait. After the war, Helen, Ruli, and their young daughter returned to the tiny Lake Como village where they had met. Beautiful and inexpensive Como, almost perfect for the two struggling artists. They knew that a professional life in this remote spot would mean constant travel, especially for Ruli, whose solo career was beginning to flourish. the 
50s and 60s, Schnabel appeared as a soloist throughout the world. One season alone in England, he played 57 programs. Summers, he was home at Como, where he reestablished his father's pre-war routine of classes. What I learned from him was the beauty of proportioning the notes or the bars one to the other, so that you had a structural basis there, as well as the emotion that you normally feel because of the melody or the harmony or the shape. And so this structure enabled you to feel that you could go out into the world and however you played, underneath your performance would always have this integrity of a work beautifully proportioned. Now the proportions are tremendously important in all art. As a matter of fact, I remember that someone once in an interview early in my life, in a radio interview which I had, he wanted to trap me. So he said, Mr. Schnabel, could you possibly tell me what it is what creates beauty in art? <laughs> now, that's a tough one to ask. <laughs> and somehow I said proportions. And he was defeated. <laughs> because it's right. Whether it is painting, whether it's even architecture, it's proportions which creates beauty in art. And it is these which the proportions one, are. Two, three, one. The proportions about which we just talked were what I would call horizontal proportions. That means between one note and the next note. It, was, it goes in this direction, the proportions. But there's a second kind of proportions, namely the vertical proportions, those which are also in English called balance. Now, the vertical proportions tell us that the octaves, if there are two octaves, are equally loud. It sounds dead. But if you bring out one of the voices, you get right away some beauty into it, this time through vertical proportions. One hears a lot of playing in which people basically play in time. But somehow, even though it's basically in time, it's not in rhythm. And one doesn't feel the rhythm is absolutely a living thing. You know what, how the heart beats. Now most people think the heart beats boom, 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 but it doesn't. A heart beats boom, 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 boom. There's always one stronger and one softer. So if you get this can you do just this voice for Real like a heartbeat. Can you hear the heart? You see, before it was just sort of a drum or something like this, but this is a heart beating. There's this great inner excitement of having this. Schnabel spent winters in New York performing and teaching. Claude Frank studied with him privately there. And he had many, many, many uh, um, wonderful ways of, of helping one with the technique. He, first of all, he did not insist that one plays a piece by heart. One could have the music. He actually practiced with one a little bit in an abbreviated way. He would say, now left hand here, and now right hand here, or do this place slowly, just so one could hear the uh, difficulties. Yeah. Now, this is technically not good. I mean, you, it's good as far as you hate the right notes. But you are playing like this. You are slapping the piano. Play all of them going up. <laughs> Not ta -te, ta -te, ta -te, because that sounds hard. Stay at the keys. Stay at the keys and go up. Let's do it slowly. And I'm 
I'm sure everybody who studied in Rulli knows very well what position technique is. He'd said, rather than, in the case of B major, think position here and a position here. The way he worked with octaves uh, to go from the large movement to increase the speed is to make smaller and smaller movements. He used the image, ping pong image, of dropping a ping pong ball and with the racket going like that. So the ball went thump, pop, 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 pop. As you diminish the motion, the octave by itself will become faster. And then and the smaller the motion is, the faster the octave will be. Now that chromatic scale is good, but not, not terrific. It would be greater if you would take the good fingering. You take, I think, this one, three, one, three, one, two, three, one, three, one, two, three. That's a fingering which nobody serious takes anymore. Actually, Chopin already knew the new fingering. The new fingering is always as many fingers as possible. So you take four fingers, now three fingers, another three fingers, now four fingers. It, after two octaves, then they come the same fingerings again. But you see, in that finger, you can speed it, and you can play such speed. It sounds like that, as if you don't try to run uphill, you see. You see, never one, three. Then you see, you can practice it like this. You can practice, you do that. Yeah, like Yeah, learn that fingering and you will have a great time. Yes, I want you to have a great trip. Thank you. Okay, thank you. okay. Don't okay. thank me for it before you have it. <laughs> Once you have it, now then you will, then you can thank me. Now let's do that same thing which I tried in the first section. Do, do just this one thing. The f two and four. Your th second and fourth finger it was a third. And do, and do it very fast, up and down. Up and down with your wrist. Very good. Yeah, you have plenty of technique. That's fine. OK, now do the same movement with the same way, also both notes together, but with these, with F and G flat and one three. But together, together. Yeah, now, now play the one finger low in the key and the other high, but still try to play together. There as you have. Now you can thank me. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> good. That's, that's good. Everybody who plays the piano, of course, practices. And they practice all their time and all their life with their hands. Forgetting that a piano is an instrument which is played with hand and feet. As a matter of fact, most of them don't even know what's going on down there. When you ask them, what kind of pedal do you take? They say, oh, oh, oh sort of some pedal I'm taking. <laughs> they, they give you some idea, but they don't know what it is. And as I always say, it is so deeply buried in the subconscious that if you want to find out what you do with your pedal, you have to go to your analyst. Schnabel believed pedaling was such an important technique that he published a book on the subject. How can we make a difference between a quarter staccato and an eighth staccato? You can't do with your hand at all. Because if you play that like this, it's not staccato anymore. It has to be that short. Now, we do that with the pedal. We are doing the eighth yes. now. It has to be as staccato as possible. I see. Yeah, but don't go up. Just, just do this. Oh, okay. That's it. You see, that, short, that, that second one was great. Okay. That's a real staccato. I mean, nobody can deny that. Now, when we come to this quarter, there we do the following. You play the finger the same way before. You play staccato, but you come immediately down with the pedal. Now, that's not enough. That's too much. Now, a little bit. You came a little bit too soon. At the end of the note, I press the pedal. You take the pedal after uh, the note. I see. And how long you take after makes the difference of the staccato. 
Okay. You see, the, the later you come, uh -huh. the, short, the shorter the staccato is sound. Okay. Beethoven pedals, especially in pianissimo, are very serious. Full pedal, not half, as long as it's marked. I full pedal. What could there be in existing situation which really is expressed by that? And I would say it is the very early morning when there is just a little bit of light coming up. And there you have this. I had full pedal. With today's pianos, which are so brash and brilliant and, and resonant, you have barely to touch the right pedal to get this kind of dreamlike uh, quality. Hey. Yeah, that's great what you do there. Finally, someone plays it in the right tempo. That's the Horowitz tempo. But you do one thing which spoils it all, and that's you take too much pedal. Take as good as no pedal at all. Tremendous speed and no pedal. Yeah, now, I'm asking you, doesn't that sound double as fast? Then he had some more sophisticated and more new things, such as uh, diminuendo on one note, forte piano on one note. Wow. By vibrating, vibrating fast and vibrating with the pedal at the same time. You crescendo. Yeah. And use on the way down, use what we call vibrating pedal. Use a vibrating pedal, that means the pedal like that. Yeah. Very fast. Yeah. Carl Ulrich, uh, whom I knew only by reputation and by his recordings, um, came to Manus to give a series of master classes there. And all the pianists rounded up. And um, I remember Peter Serkin played, and Ursula Oppens, um, Mari Pariah played. And the classes that he gave were a revelation to us. We'll start working with the student and before before the class is over, or before that segment of the class is over, sometimes the student is playing with a lot of spirit and imagination and things that I would never have thought were there to begin with. People in the audience, you know, they were just saying, you know, with the, they learned as much tonight in this one session as they have in the last 20 years or in 15 years of their studying piano. Actually, I uh, tried to do something different. At that time, there were not so many master classes of that. Uh, when you had the uh, word class, it generally meant that there was quite a number of people playing or something like that. And I realized I would really do what I do in private lessons, but with an audience. As I love audiences, it, uh, I prefer doing that to private lessons. Way, no matter how you played, you were made to feel wonderful. Somehow, uh, Kalorik had a way of putting people at their ease, making them feel they had just given him a gift, and then the work began. It almost seemed like the, the playing of the piano was a way of getting beyond the piano, something I'd always felt, but I'd never actually um, experienced anybody who taught that. Peter Serkin, who has studied with Ruli for many years, recently wrote, 
His imagination and tone coloring is revelatory. His discoveries in how to affect a varied application of articulation opens an expanded vocabulary for the piano. He even teaches crescendi on a note or on a chord. to believe the piano was necessarily a non-crescendo instrument. This is something I've, I haven't been able to, uh, to achieve on my own, and I haven't, in a certain way, agreed with it, because I tend to feel that that is one of the limitations that the piano sets us. How would it be if you make a crescendo on that note? Start it soft and... make a crescendo on the note, I'll show you. Do this once. Do the same movement, but don't repeat the note. Ah. It takes a, time, a bit of time. Now it's a little bit less repeating. For his 90th birthday, former students gathered to pay tribute to their teacher and to reminisce. Several had studied with him at Como more than 50 years ago. We lived cheek by jowl all the time. We were in each other's rooms. We were playing for each other. We, were, we knew each other's habits from the word go. And so there were parties and, uh, you know, we had social times together and so we just stayed in touch people and make ourselves comfortable making music together had long been a schnabel family tradition artur began accompanying teresa shortly before their marriage and father and son performed and recorded as a duo A little bit before and then the whole time of our marriage, we played four hands together. In contrast to what many people think, that the greatest compositions are for two pianos, the, great, the much greater compositions are for forehand. But they are so much more difficult because one always plays one half of something. When they played together, I mean, it was quite something. You, never, you would never have known it was two people playing. When you shut your eyes, there was such a perfect sound. The balance was so perfect. That the t because in forehand, sometimes the bass is so loud, you can't hear the treble. With them, it was, if you shut your eyes, the playing was, was a meeting of, of souls. For a number of years after she died, I couldn't play at all. See, I did not lo only lose a wife, but I lost a partner, too. It was extremely hard. But after a few years, I realized that with all the experience I had had with that, in that whole field, 
that it would make sense if I take it up again. And then I took it up as a new partner, a Canadian pianist by the name of John Rowland. completely different story than it is playing with two hands. I guess the two things that are the most, that are of supreme importance in playing forehand are transparency and precision. Transparency is just this balancing this, bringing out top voice or bringing out middle voices or making your voices sound like other instruments because it's like chamber music, uh, very much like chamber music, into weavings of different voices with different characters. Different things are demanded from each player. And the bass, it's more sustaining with lovely sounds and bringing out just certain notes. The treble has to be very clear and a little more technically secure. It's a tough job. Uh, to do all this, and we do very good, and that means also very problematic works. He was like larger than life. I mean, it was just, he was surging forward, and he'd grunt, and he'd sing, and um, I mean, I had to, as they say, project my voice. <laughs> so I learned to speak up. I'm continually screaming at him. Or, yeah, excuse me, he says screaming, but I just tell him nicely. Or I tell him, you're much too loud. We don't want to hear all that. When I play the bass, he's always telling me to, shh, 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 shh. you're much too loud. I can't hear myself. So this is what we go on, like children, sort of. Then the other thing is precision. It's much more difficult to play four heads because it's a percussion instrument, really. To play two notes together in a percussion instrument is more difficult than with a singer or a violin because they can sort of slide in. If you hear tadum, tadum, they haven't really practiced a lot together. And the audience doesn't know quite what it is, but they hear it and there's a little unsettled, a little amateurish. We write down every instruction, this sort of fastidiousness that Schnabel has of knowing when we're going to make a little weight or when we're not going to make a weight or when we're going to have a little retard. It's all written down. Another very difficult and different thing is pedaling for each other. Uh, and we give it to the one who needs it the most. Of course, sometimes one of us forgets to take the foot off and then goes just like <clears throat> push over, you know, and oh. Well, we do that, and I get quite annoyed. Then it's what comes over on my little old sandals that are kind of bare, and boom, and then I go, oh! When the music takes off, and when he starts to look up to heaven and love, love every bit that he's playing, and that's, that's one of the very great characteristics of his playing is this heartfelt um, uh, expressivity when he's playing. I mean, he's, he's in love with it, and so th that's catching. I knew Arthur Schnabel had a son who played piano, but I didn't know who he was. And I, I got here, I got to meet him. I was very uh, honored to meet him. Great! I almost think you broke all records, all records of speed. It will be even more impressive, your great and fast tempo which you use, if at the beginning the largo is extremely slow. Can you try? <laughs> mm. 
the attitude there was something that was, for me, at the age of 15, something totally new. It was, first of all, that it's holy territory. You see, the, mu the playing of good music is, is holy territory. It's, it's like an inner sanctum of some kind. We are the vehicles for the great music. It's not the other way around. This was great. <laughs> Only for one thing. This is a quarter. You play. That's wrong. No, it was an eighth again. The first one was right now. It should be quarter. No, there's no staccato in the edition. What is your edition? Maybe it's Henley. I can't imagine. What is that? Henley. Yeah. Yeah. But this here, this is the old Breitkopf, that is still better. He, of course, introduced me to the idea and to the importance of good editions at a time when I didn't even know what an edition was. You know, I, sp I played from an edition that I had bought in a, s in a store. He said, no, no, this, of course, won't do. You'll have to play from the kritisch durchgesehene Gesamtausgabe. Now, nothing was obtainable at that time in New York. So he says, you have to go to the public library, 42nd Street, with your score and, and, uh, and uh, copy. That is, make the corrections. And of course, I did spend hours and hours. It was a lot of work. If you play from an original <coughs> edition, you have the choice either doing what the composer wanted you to do, or feeling even yourself that you are a little bit of a criminal who is doing wrong things. But when you play from an edition which is not good, then really the sky is the limit. Whenever there comes a place which you don't like, which it is, you say, no, I think that's better in piano. Probably that's just in the edition. You never look up an original edition. And before you know it, you play everything just the way you like it and not the way the composer liked it. And the combination of this extreme uh, fidelity and fantastic, zealous attention to everything and the sense that from that powerful foundation and springboard you could then take a wild leap into the unknown and end up who knows where. This kind of dialectic was the thing that made those lessons fabulous for me and continue to inform Coleridge's teaching. We get the theme suddenly half as fast, don't we? Yeah. So show suddenly, also in character, that's not anymore. Bam, play it also with more dignity and more balance. I hear the one, two, three loud. One, two, three, one, two, three. <coughs> it's fine that you play them so even yeah. and that you play them staccato or legato, wherever you're supposed to. But do play always with differentiation. You see, you play many of those things like. <laughs> You see, in all languages I know, yes. we always have strong syllables and lighter syllables. Yes. Now, I don't know which is your language? Uh, Korean. Korean. Yeah. Now, in the Korean language, are there places where one has to, to talk like this? No. No, there aren't. Yeah. That's it. But you do play like that, yeah. and that way it becomes a machine yeah. instead of a person. So I didn't, do not want to talk it down. What you do is marvelous. It's terrific. But it could be marvelous, terrific, 
and impressive and right. I'm afraid that much of the teaching now is, is focused on perfection. Well, there, there are different kind of people who go to concerts. Yeah, certainly there are the, the ones who go to hear absolutely faultless finger work, you know, the thunderous octaves and things like that, and they come away really impressed. When I was a child, I turned the radio on in New Zealand, where I was born, and I could say, that's Schnabel playing, well, this is um, Arthur Rubenstein, this is Rick Maninoff, this is Corto. Why would you put it on, you knew? And you put it on now, and this could be anybody, it's just it's a computer not. going on and on and on. No individuality, no feeling, no poetry. Somehow, as we become more and more attuned to our computers and our, our fax machines, uh, we forget about depth of feeling. I don't know how many times I hear people say that uh, they put on classical music to relax. Well, I never put on classical music to relax. I want classical music to move me, to take me someplace. And that is what one learns from a great teacher such as Mr. Schnabel. There are these performances, some of them, which are nothing but almost, almost senseless noise. Mm -hmm. And then the others are senseless creeping of many insects. It's like the middle of an, of an ant heap, you understand? Well, Every ant runs in the other way, with only one great sense. In the ant heap, there's order. Mm -hmm. While in this stuff, the order has to be found yet. Yeah. And maybe you will be the one who really finds it. You are very near it. So that was very good now. And this was, a, this was now at first attempt in the new way. It was so good. You see, it, 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 it should be a bit of a revelation. Yes. Not from me, but from the composer. Any other times in my life, when I studied a certain piece, I would just study it. Just, I don't know, kind of lightly study it and just bring it to teacher and then just kind of get all the, all the juices from them and then make my peace. But here, I can't do that. I have to work, I have to work my butts off. Yeah, but you see, that's the end of the piece, really. Yeah. That they, now you just say, so goodbye. <laughs> there we can go home finally. Which are getting more and more puzzling. <sighs> All these not fitting harmonies, and then suddenly we are home. Da. Yeah, great. No, I, I must say, I'm very impressed about this, what you do there. Very impressed by your technique. I was not impressed yet by some of the other things yeah. because it was just notes mm -hmm. and too much pedal. Yeah, I agree. Too. In about a week or two, if you practice it the right way, you'll have it completely. And you'll stun the world with it. Year after year, young pianists who have studied with Schnabel have been winners in competitions throughout the world. His own career began more than 75 years ago. There were the 30 years of solo concerts, the longer period of four-hand performances, and a discography of more than 30 recordings. 
But in a time when teachers are the last to receive recognition, perhaps the most impressive tribute of all is this acknowledgement. Studied with Carl Ulrich Schnabel. Off. No, 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 you did not count. <laughs> 